بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين محمد بن عبد الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وقال اتخذ الله ولدا سبحانه بل له ما في السماوات والأرض كل له قانتون This is the claim that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks of with respect to the accusations that the Jews and the Christians have made against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the claim that the inanimate objects that we see and we use day in and day out that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put to our service react in such a violent manner as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes their reaction in Surah Maryam, وَقَالُوا اتَّخَذَ الرَّحْمَانُ وَلَدًا And then, تَكَالُوا السَّمَاوَاتُ يَتَفَطَّرْنَ وَتَنْشَقُّ الْأَرْضُ وَتَخِرُّ الْجِبَالُ هَدَّا أَنْ دَعَوْا لِلرَّحْمَانِ وَلَدًا That the heavens would come tumbling down, the mountains would collapse and split, the earth would react such, in such a violent manner that a claim against Ar-Rahman, the All-Gracious, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, has been made that He has taken a son. Now let's take a bit of an analytical uh, you know, view of this claim that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken a son. You and I as a human being, we love to have children. But why do we have children? What is the purpose of having children? We have children because it's the only way for the life to continue its cycle. And we have children because we want to leave someone behind us that will carry our name and our legacy, if you will, and continue with this life. We have children so when we get old and we age, these children will become of aid to us. We can have someone to rely on, someone to depend on, and for many other reasons. Now the question is, why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala want to have children? The one who's always been there and will always be there. When the Jews claim that Uzair is the son of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, subhanahu wa ta'ala amma shaykun, and the Jews make similar claim that Isa alayhi salam is the son of God, subhanahu wa ta'ala amma shaykun. Where was the kingship and the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before Isa and before Uzair? And where is it after the death of Isa and the death of Uzair as they believe that they both have died? Nothing has changed in the dominion of the heavens and the earth. So we as Muslims, are the only ones that hold the true aqidah that we believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as he says subhana and the word subhana mentioned in the Quran in the imperative form in the past tense in the present tense and it's mentioned here in the original form of the like in the in the ism masdar in the noun form if you will which means Subhanahu, or as we recite in Surah uh, Subhana Ladi Asra Bi Abdihi, Surah Bani Israel, Subhana Ladi Asra Bi Abdihi, the linguists say this is Ism Masdar, meaning that whether we did Tasbih, we are doing Tasbih, or will, do we, or will we do Tasbih or not, Tasbih belongs to Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala as a matter of fact. So irrespective of us existing and engaging in the tasbih of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the lack of our existence or the lack of the existence of the entire creation, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala belongs all the tasbih. To Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala belongs all the tasbih. So we look at how we believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in terms of his entity. In terms of his physical presence, his physical presence is unlike any of us. There is no one like unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No one resembles him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala affirms certain physical qualities that he has. And he negates certain physical quality, qualities that he may have. And in that we believe. We have not seen Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. لا تدرك الأبصار Our eyesight cannot reach him. It is so deficient. Our minds cannot visualize him. They are so deficient. Our hearing cannot hear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as he speaks. Nor can the angel with the exception of Jibreel alayhi salam. Similarly, when we talk about these are the physical attributes, when we talk about the qualities, the divine qualities and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, similarly, لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ Meaning that, هُوَ الْحَيْ He is the all-living. He is the one who is the eternal. I am Hay, I'm alive. But my physical presence, my life is not like the life of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the immortal, the one who's always been there and will always be there. He is a samad, meaning that he's the one who's self-subsisting. Meaning that he does not need anyone or anything to continue to exist. My life is dependent on food and water and oxygen and many other elements without which I would cease to exist. So in his divine qualities and attributes, ليس شيء. There is no one like it unto him. Similarly with his actions, the actions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, كُنْ فَيَكُونْ Be and it is. And in fact his actions are words, merely words. Be and it is. And in fact before the statement is made, be, the actions have taken place already. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in, in the hadith, إِنَّ أَوَّلَ مَا خَلَقَ اللَّهُ الْقَلَمْ When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first created a pen, قَالَ لَهُ اكْتُبْ قَالَ رَبِّ وَمَا أَكْتُبْ He said, oh, write. He said, oh Allah, what do I write? He said, اُكْتُبْ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ كَائِنٍ إِلَى يَوْمَ الْقِيَامِ Write everything that's going to take place until the Day of Judgment. Are these actions? They're actions. They've been decreed in the preserved tablet, and they shall come to materialize in due time in due proportion, at the right time and at the right place. So his actions are not like mine. That's why the ayah concludes with بَدِيعُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ بَدِيعُ from invention, if you will. Meaning that there was nothing before for him to resemble this creation. And that's where the word bid'a comes from. Of course, here it's a different subject, but just to give an example, there's the bid'a hasana, the bid'a sayyah. The bid'a hasana that has its roots you know, and its objectives and the overall objectives of Islam. Bid'a sayyi'ah, meaning that we have not received that, neither in the Qur'an or in the Sunnah or in the actions of the Sahaba and the Khulafa. That's what, it's a bid'a sayyi'ah and it negates what came in the Qur'an and the Sunnah. Meaning that somebody invented something into this deen that is not part of it. Okay? So when we say, Badir al-Samawati wal-Ard, he's the one who invented in his creation the heavens and the earth. And similarly, this is indicative of how meticulous the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that none of us can invent such a thing or even replicate or create something similar to it. Badi'u samawati wal ard, he is the inventor and the creator of the heavens and the earth. Badi'u samawati wal ardi, kullun lahu qanitun, everything shall come into submission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this dunya and in the hereafter. In this dunya, everything is under his control. Everything that takes place is with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Things and matters that he is pleased with and he accepts and rewards for and things and matter he allows to happen by way of giving them a chance to rectify their actions or be reckoned on the day of judgment. But everything is under his control. On judgment day, everybody shall come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as he says, وَإِن كُلُّ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ إِلَّا آتِ الرَّحْمَانِ عَبْدًا Everything that is in the heavens and on earth shall come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a state of submission. وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ لَوْ لَا يُكَلِّمُنَ اللَّهُ أَوْ تَأْتِينَ آيَةً It's just a continuation of the demands that those who disbelieved in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those who committed shirk in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, demands that, he, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam bring more ayat and more ayat and more ayat. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَوَلَمْ يَكْفِهِمْ أَنَّا أَنزَلْنَا عَلَيْكَ الْقُرْآنَ يُتْلَى عَلَيْهِمْ Isn't it sufficient? And this is how the greatness of this Qur'an, which inshallah we'll talk about that in more details in the next session, how the greatness of the Qur'an on every front is a miracle, it's a continuing miracle. It's a continuing and perpetual miracle until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees that it be uplifted. أَوَلَمْ يَكْفِهِمْ أَنَّا أَنزَلْنَا عَلَيْكَ الْقُرْآنَ يُتْلَى عَلَيْهِمْ Isn't it sufficient that this Qur'an has been descended upon you so you can recite it upon them? So no matter what ayah they ask for, you bring to them, they shall not become believers. إِنَّا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ بِالْحَقِّ بَشِيرًا وَنَذِيرًا وَلَا تُسْأَلُ عَنْ أَصْحَابِ الْجَحِيمِ Indeed, we have sent you with this truth. And everyone who disbelieves in the truth is bound to believe in that which is contrary or different from the truth, meaning that is bound to follow a path of misguidance. إِنَّا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ بِالْحَقِّ بَشِيرًا وَنَذِيرًا وَلَا تُسْأَلُ عَنْ أَصْحَابِ الْجَحِيمِ And you will not be asked about those who have gone astray. وَلَن تَرْضَى عَنْكَ الْيَهُودُ وَلَا النَّصَارَى حَتَّى تَتَّبِعَ مِلَّتَهُمْ This is for us to ponder and to take heed from. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa that the Jews and the Christians will not be pleased with you. And a rida here means that 
Rida al qalb. It is the satisfaction and the love of the heart. And the satisfaction of the love of the heart cannot be done or achieved except that one follow the same path. In other words, you love to have friends that are like you. You love for your friends to do things that you like. You love for your friends to hold the aqidah, a creed, a philosophy, a belief, a principle that you follow. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send in a very strong message to the believers by way of addressing the Prophet. That they shall not be pleased with you until you follow, until you follow their millah, until you follow their shirk. So that's why there's a difference between being kind to the people of the book, making an effort to do favors to them in order to, you know, uh, get them to, you know, look at your milla, in order to get them to embrace Islam, to follow the path of guidance, and getting them to be pleased with you as a Muslim. If you're going to stay a Muslim, a true believer in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they shall never be ple uh, pleased with you. They shall never be pleased with you. If you accept that what they're upon is a religion that is acceptable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that, that is an act of shirk on your behalf. That is an act of shirk on your part. And this is only part of the negotiation and process. We accept you as a Muslim. You accept us as Christians. What's wrong with that? You accept us as Jews. What does that mean? I accept you as a human being. I will do whatever it takes within the boundaries of Islam to coexist with you just like the Prophet ﷺ did with the Jews in the Medina. You know, he struck many treaties with them and he, you know, they've exchanged gifts, at, you know, in, in some respect. But that does not mean he accepted them, meaning that accepted their aqeedah and their millah, because the Prophet ﷺ would not accept any act of shirk whatsoever. So the first thing they want to get you to do, part of this interfaith work, and part of let's come together, you know, we are all people of faith, we're all good, you're going to Jannah, we're going to Jannah, what's the problem? That is not the case. That is not the case. Because when you have ideologies that are completely contradictive, at best, best case scenario is one ideology is correct. True or not? At best case scenario, one ideology is correct. If I present you with a color, and everybody here says, this is white, and somebody says, I see it black, except me for what I see it. So that can't be. You, you, are, you are asking me to accept something that is contrary to the truth. So therefore, one of us can only be right. It's either black or white, or whatever the color is. It doesn't matter. So in this case, their aqid is aqid of shirk. So how can I accept that? I accept you as a human being. I accept you and different being, being accepting of someone is different being respecting what they believe in. In other words, you, you, you expect of me to accept you as a human being, to respect you as a human being, that's all well and good. To invite you to my aqidah, to invite you to my Islam, to, to coexist with you in harmony, with friendships and so forth, to work with you on matters that we agree upon, that this is right and this is wrong, that's perfect, that's wonderful. We are, as Muslims, commanded to do so. But to accept your aqidah and respect that, how can I respect shirk? How can I respect the aqidah that says the Almighty God has taken a son, or the Almighty God has died, or he's one of the three, or any of that? I cannot, as a Muslim, with you know, the, the purity of aqidah that I have, accept such an act of misguidance. That, as we mentioned, you know, the heavens would come tumbling down, the mountains would shatter as a result, the earth would split open because of a reaction. How about me as a Muslim, the one with the only true aqidah, how should I react to this? Of course, the Sahaba's reaction to that, it was something that is, cannot be more repulsive to the human nature, to the nature, to the purity of the heart of the believer. It cannot be more, more repulsive to the extent that the Sahaba did not want to look at someone who commits shirk in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is how, repulsive, how repulsive they found. Now, if they're ignorant, we educate them, we teach them, right? And if they are insistent upon the misguidance, then we turn away from them. We turn away from them. If they fight us in our deen, we fight them back. We stand up for ourselves. You know, oftentimes we as Muslims sort of like, we shy away from such statements. Statements, rights that every society on the face of the earth, religious or not religious, has come to recognize that we have the right as human beings, not just as Muslims, as a human beings, to defend our countries, 
to defend our property, to defend ourselves, to defend our families, and so on and so forth, all that that we believe in. Everybody is accepting of that, but when it comes to a Muslim, no, 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 you don't have the right to do that. You don't have the right. And that's why you see now on every front, unfortunately, every time Islam seems to emerge in a country, you know, the unity of evil gathers in order to extinguish the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, be it in Egypt or in Syria or any other country, to the extent, unfortunately, some of the so-called Muslim rulers, right, they also fight these countries and these Muslim groups in order to what? In order to maintain their status and their position and to please their leaders. And that's the leaders of the East and the leaders of the West. سبحانك اللهم بحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين جزاكم الله خيرا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته